Okay, hello everybody. This is Paula Newcomb and I'm here with Katie Springer. Um, we're going to talk today about the Indiana State Data Center and access to the data that you need. Um, of course, we'll, she'll talk more about it, probably information that you need for your reports, doing your grants, um, publicity, lots of, inf lots of things that you need to do at the library. Um, so Katie is here today with us and going to tell us all about the uh, State Data Center. She's been, had her job, she's telling me about nine and a half years. She's the coordinator of the State Data Center um, here at the Indiana State Library and she's also a reference librarian here at the Indiana State Library. Um, today we're going to record the presentation and we'll, I'll get those LEUs out to you probably in about the next 30 days. It's always nice if I can do it quicker. Um, also, we'll put the ISL uh, slide share, we'll put the presentation there. So, we'll go ahead, I'll hand it back over to Katie Springer and we'll learn all about the Indiana State Data Center. Thanks. Hi there. Like Paula said, um, welcome to Indiana's State Data Center, access to the data you need. I'm a reference librarian here at the State Library and coordinate the program, which is a federal state cooperative program between the U.S. Census Bureau and the state of Indiana. It helps establish collaborations for locating, sharing, and using data between academics, economists, government agencies, libraries, and other community-minded organizations right here in Indiana. Today I'll be talking to you about the program and what it can do for you. The state of Indiana has had a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Census Bureau officially since 1978 to provide data access and training to the state agencies, academics, nonprofits, NGOs, and the public. As a part of this agreement, we use historical and current sources to answer data requests from around the world and provide training on-site and online. In 1988, the Business and Industry Data Center portion of the program, or the BIDC, was added. In addition to the general public, it provides businesses with education and access to Census Bureau data and other statistical resources. The data center program itself is part of a national network of economists, government agencies, educators, community leaders, and other professionals in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the island areas. You'll have to forgive me, I've had a cold for the last week or so, so I may um, excuse myself by coughing and cough um, and I'll be right back um, with you if that should happen. Um, one thing that the data center does is that we collaborate with other agencies around Indiana, uh, not only government agencies but other development organizations. Um, our main collabor collaborators are the Indiana Business Research Center of IU's Kelly School of Business. They are the lead business and industry data center, or BIDC. Our other main affiliates are the Department of Workforce Development here at the state government and the Indiana Geographic Information Council, or IGIC. We also work with IUPUI's Polis Center. Our state has a network of current and former state data center affiliate agencies and organizations. Affiliate agencies help the public find answers to st statistical and data requests. We are all here to support you in your efforts to locate good data and enhance data access for everyone. We're a statewide network of professionals. If you're stuck on someone's request for information, pick up the phone or email me. That's what we're here for. The map on the right, this shows our current network of affiliates. Um, this was up updated as of the beginning of this year, and we are constantly adding new affiliates. Uh, as I meet people at conferences or as people uh, approach us um, to learn more about uh, the data that is available and how they can help their communities uh, build better um, portals online uh, for data access and have more partnerships uh, to uh, just make sure that the public has access to all of the public data that is coming out um, constantly. There is a constant um, inflow of data that is released from federal agencies and state agencies. And one of the, the things that we do is we try to simplify uh, the process by which you go through uh, to get those 
um, those data points. So some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, it, it, we're going to talk about uh, the agencies that have portals to Indiana data that are available online. And these are um, different agencies and organizations that have pulled together uh, the data from multiple sources and they provide easy to use access um, on the online. Um, so here at the State Library, uh, we have many librarians on staff with expertise in various subject areas. We all act as a team to help you obtain data on a variety of topics. You can walk in, call us, or use Ask a Librarian for data requests. On the right, you'll see the link to our website. It's the State Data Center website off of the State Library's website. Um, you'll see some of the links uh, they're kind of tiny in this screen, but you'll be able to uh, click on these links to find out more about the program, the history of the program, uh, and get to that map that we saw on the previous slide. You'll also see links to all of the main organizations that we work with, the IBRC, the Workforce Development link, and the IJIC link. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, of course, is our physical address. You can always walk in uh, or call, and I'm always available via email. The State Data Center also man maintains a statistics by topic guide, which lets you choose from hundreds of links to government and NGO resources for local, national, and state-level data. This is organized by topic for easy use. New links on this site include data.gov, which is the federal portal to federal and state statistical files, the Kids Count in Indiana database, which is run by the Annie E. Casey Foundation um, and the Indiana Youth Institute, mapping application for public safety from IndyGov, uh, and the maternal and child health reports from the Indiana State Department of Health and much more. The State Data Center is also very active on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest accounts. If you have a chance to visit these accounts, um, the Facebook account I've been running for a few years and we have quite a few followers. I'm always pushing out new uh, news stories and new interesting data points on Facebook and Twitter, so please follow these accounts. They're very useful for knowing some of the current data releases that are coming out from the Census Bureau and other federal and state agencies. The Pinterest account is more of an educational, fun account, um, and it has a lot more of the data visualization and infographics. Uh, one of the great things about these social media pages is that you can go to them 24-7 uh, to find information on data literacy, big data, and data visualization. Um, a lot of the kind of the hot topics that um, are coming out now surrounding big data and open data, you'll see me push out different press releases, and news stories through these social media accounts. So please follow these accounts. Um, now I'm going to take you through a few of the public portals for Indiana data that are available online through the partnerships that the State Data Center program has with these agencies. We'll start with the Indiana Business Research Center through IU's Kelly School of Business. The Data Center partners closely with the IBRC to provide the public with immediate access to federal and state data as it is released to the public. The organization itself has served Indiana since 1925, and it provides economic information that is needed by Indiana's businesses, governments, and nonprofit organizations, as well as data users like us and our patrons. The IBRC maintains the Stats Indiana website, which is the main website we direct the public to. Here you can find Indiana information by topic across the top or via an alphabetical list on data by topic. That's the second um, 
choice over on the, um, the bar up at the top. And the data by top topic will give you an alphabetical list of uh, all of the topics that are covered on this website. Uh, it's not as um, comprehensive as the statistics by topic page on the Indiana State Data Center website. Um, it, it basically guides you to Indiana data, whereas the statistics by topic page uh, gives you access to federal and international data as well. Um, on the Stats Indiana website, you'll find population numbers, figures on employment and earnings, and direct access to Census Bureau data for Indiana. Special features of this site include county level demographic profiles of all 92 counties, a cost of living calculator which creates salary comparisons between Indiana communities and metro areas throughout the country, and the Indiana Dashboard, a summary of key economic indicators which presents key variables from the Stats Indiana databases in graphic form. The IBRC also helps maintain the new gateway to government information through the Department of Local Government Finance. This multi-agency effort lets taxpayers know where their tax, tax dollars go. You can learn here about local government budgets, build your own reports, and download current and historical data directly from the website. This also allows you to search by address with results showing you the total adopted budget for your community. It also has a contact officials feature, which allows you to view addresses, emails, and phone numbers for government offices. For additional demographic, economic, and workforce news from the IBRC, you can use the websites here to look at the Indiana Economic Digest and the online monthly publication in context. The Economic Digest is a co collaboration between the Realtors of Indiana the Indiana Business Research Center, and the Hoosier State Press Association. It collects business and economic news from the news outlets throughout the state, and also organizes stories by topic for easy searching. In Con Context contains analytic articles which look at current events and trends in Indiana business and industry. The next site is called Hoosiers by the Numbers. This is from the Indiana Department Department of Workforce Development, and I like to call this a, a homegrown uh, effort. Uh, they say they strive for accuracy and timeliness in providing data about workforce and employment and developing new products to meet data user demand. So that's their, their kind of tagline for their efforts to provide Indiana data on the workforce. On the left-hand sidebar of this site, you'll find economic indicators income and wage data, occupation data, unemployment data, and more for Indiana. Um, this slide, I don't know if I've updated in the last year, so they may have even updated their website since, now, since this slide. Um, I encourage you to go to the Hoosiers by the Numbers website, it's also called hoosierdata.in.gov. Um, there are a few different new tools that are really valuable to data users. There are radius tools that are often hard to find in, uh, we're getting a message from somebody that they have changed the site layout, so I will be changing this slide the next time I put this up. Um, go ahead and um, visit this. Uh, check out their new website and check out some of the new tools they may have added. Uh, like I said, the RADIUS tools are very valuable. They allow you to search from a certain geographic point out um, at mile radiuses, so you know, 5 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, and often it'll, it'll give you unemployment data and, um, and economic data for those, uh, the regions that you're um, putting the radius on. This is something that um, you might not think is a very, uh, you know, difficult thing to provide for the public, but it's been um, a, a work in progress for a while to get a radius tool that is um, operating online for the public for free. The Missouri State Data Center website also had a radius tool. They still use it. It's called Circular Area Profiles, which is free for the public to use. Um, but the interface is a, it's a little bit um, 
tech heavy and, and not necessarily for the general data users. Uh, with Hoosiers by the Numbers and also with some of the new RADIUS tools on the Stats Indiana website, you'll find them much easier to use than, um, than other tools that have been out there for the public to use. Also on this site, you'll be able to find uh, topics for Indiana on the Con Consumer Price Index or CPI, industry projections for Indiana, jobs by industry, and jobs by race and ethnicity. The Data Center works closely with the Indiana Geographic Information Council or IGIC. Um, I sat on the board of directors for three years and I still attend meetings and stay updated on the status of geo information in Indiana. The uh, IGIC has a, um, both an, a geographic information day every year in the fall and a conference every year in the spring. I try to keep everybody updated on the goings on of um, different IGIC projects and different ways that they help provide maps and data uh, to the public. If you have a chance to go onto their, um, their website, I'll talk about it a little bit. It's called Indiana Map and that's their main resource that they uh, provide for the public through uh, several partnerships, one of them being the IU Geography Department and the IUPUI Ge Geography Department. They have been providing the Indiana map for a number of years and it has grown and grown uh, to, um, to the point of having more than 300 layers of data that is uh, viewable and downloadable. <clears throat> so, um, they, they promote themselves as making map data accessible to both expert GIS users and the general public. Uh, we've been working on a series of webinars um, on Indiana map. We've got a beginning um, to use Indiana MAP webinar and that's up on the State Data Center's website. We're also working on a new project with Indiana MAP uh, where we're interviewing different geographic professionals about what they do and how they use GIS during the day. Uh, so that'll be available on the um, Indiana MAP and IGIC um, website. Uh, eventually as we um, put more videos of these GIS professionals um, online. Uh, Indiana Map, uh, as I said, is um, contains uh, hundreds of layers of data that you can use and if you go onto the website under any of these uh, selections running across the center of the screen, view the map, data and resources, initiatives or partners. You can see um, either uh, direct access to the map or a listing of all of the resources that are behind the map. The Indiana State Department of Health website holds statistics and reports on a number of different subjects including statewide health needs, the Behavior Risk Factors Surveillance System, or BRFSS, injury reports for the state, birth, marriage, and death data, and the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or YRBS. They have a very helpful data user's guide. Um, this tells users about the importance of interpreting data within the decision-making process. It describes different types of rates used in health information, age or race specific rates, age adjusted rates, and incidence and prevalence rates. It also teaches users how to calculate rates and percent changes. Uh, the Indiana Department of Education website is full of good data as well. You can use the DOE compass to find profiles for particular schools or corporations in the state. You can create customized student data reports, view school calendars, or look at school performance indicators like ISTEP. You may look up specific educators, search for licenses, and search for school board members on this website. 
IUPUI has become a huge supporter of data access via the POLIS Center. This is a self-funded re self research unit of the IU School of Liberal Arts. They work with professional and scholarly communities, especially through application of digital technologies such as GIS and other geospatial tools. Some of their major efforts include projects with national and state departments of homeland security, helping communities with hazard mitigation and planning. It also has partnerships in health geoinformatics, linking clinical and community information to understanding issues relating to public health. The Polis Center has become an excellent resource for locating data about central Indiana. Their public interface is called savvy.org. Uh, savvy stands for Social Assets and Vulnerabilities Indicators. The Polis Center calls this the nation's largest community information system and it's notable for the availability of neighborhood level information for 10 counties in central Indiana. The counties that Savvy um, covers are Marion County and then all of the surrounding counties, so what we call the donut counties. The great thing about Savvy is that it provides data that would otherwise have to be culled from Census Bureau data and uh, combined by census tract and block. Um, what Savvy does is that it combines all of that um, for you and puts it in an interface where you can look up neighborhood level data. Say you want to look up data on Mars Hill downtown. You can go to the Savvy website and they have a nice uh, uh, search box that after several iterations of Savvy, it, it kind of become more and more like uh, a Google format where you really just have to go to the search box and type in your neighborhood. Um, and then it comes up, up with several different panels of information um, depending on uh, what you need. They've, they've got <clears throat> a history tab, uh, a demographic tab, and if we have time at the end of the presentation, I'll take you onto the Savvy website and show you some of the things that you can do with the neighborhood level data. So <clears throat> being the state library, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to take a drink of water. Um, we of course would have to mention the Federal Depository Library Program. The Indiana State Library itself is the regional uh, depository, which means they're the head federal depository library in Indiana. Um, FDLP documents are an excellent resource for Indiana data. Um, you'll find um, all kinds of reports that the federal government puts out annually uh, that are located in federal depository libraries. FDLP libraries are also valuable for um, having staff that can help you with government information. So they'll have staff on duty uh, to help you navigate the world of uh, Fed Docs and all of the different federal websites there, there are now that, um, that publish and archive federal data. So any FDLP library in the state is also a good resource for you when you're looking for data. So the census.gov is the main website that um, I help people train on using American Fact Finder. Um, and while I um, have you in this part of the presentation, I'm just going to explain a little bit about how the Census Bureau is related to the program. And then we'll uh, explore some of the websites that we've just uh, done an overview of and I'll do um, some, I'll let people ask questions and uh, we'll do, run through some sample questions. So uh, the Census Bureau has uh, been involved with data dissemination uh, since 1790, since the 1790 census. We have access to the 1790 through the present censuses here at the State Library. So if you're looking for um, statistical data 
about any of the decennial censuses, you can come here to the State Library and do that kind of historical research. Not all libraries have that kind of historical um, collection, uh, but we do here. And it, it's a combination of different resources that we've got. We've got the FDLP volumes, which means you can flip through um, all of the state's uh, data for censuses going back um, to uh, really, really the entire uh, run of the census. So we provide access to not only Indiana data, but data from other states. We also provide online um, resource help for historical data. The Census Bureau provides historical data on their website, but it's only in a PDF form. So it doesn't have, uh, you know, you can't search for characters or numbers in their PDFs. They're basically like, flipping through a volume like you do maybe on Internet Archive. So if you go to the Census Bureau's website, which actually I'm going to show you that right now because it's kind of interesting to see. <clears throat> so let me go to the web and so we'll go to the Census Bureau's website, which is www.census.gov. And uh, I am a big um, search box user, so what I press in is decennial census and see what I get. This first um, result, while interesting, is not exactly what we need. What we need is the second result, which is the decennial census of population and housing. Actually, uh, that one. Census of population and housing is probably what we need. Yep, this is the portal to all of the decennial censuses back to 1790. They have digitized most of these volumes. Um, some of the notes on this website will show you what exactly is and is not available on this website. Um, but say we open up the 1790 census, this is what it's going to look like. It's not going to have all of the states because, of course, the states did not all exist in 1790. So <clears throat> you can go into the title page and look at the table of contents to see what they have available. Or you can uh, click the link to the full document, which allows you access to all of the data. So let's go to maybe a more recent one, say, um, 1930 and go into the 1930 census documents on agriculture and then it'll show you what is available, the title page and the full document. And let's go up to a very recent one, 2010. going to take you to the list of states. We're going to choose Indiana. Looks like this is a summary. And as you can see, this is a PDF. It's not the kind of thing that is going to let you search for tables um, and single numbers, but you can flip through it and read through it. So. This is the way they provide access to all of the decennial census tables. Now, this is a great resource that exists. That the Census Bureau provides all of this in one spot is, is incredible. But for the most part, it, it is sometimes hard to, oh, did I? Uh, to access everything that you need from a print um, resource. Because when you're looking for data on something, you're, you're really looking for that specific number. And looking through PDFs 
um, while it's great that this exists all in one place, it's a very long process to, to have to uh, go through all of the PDFs um, when you're just looking for a quick number. So what the, the Census Bureau provides us is a product called American Fact Finder, rather an application. So this is an interface that allows you to search through Census Bureau tables that go um, back from 2010 uh, to I think 2000 or possibly even 1990. Some of that data is in here, but it's it's mostly the last 20 years of the census that this provides you access to. So um, what we can do is uh, do some sample searches. So community facts, I'm going to single somebody out here, Monticello, Indiana, because I know one of the people in our audience is from Monticello. So you can see from these quick facts that it's going to instantly give you a number. So we know that in 2010, during the 2010 census, there were 5,378 people in Monticello. There are um, breakdowns of each resource, each survey that the Census Bureau puts out. So you can use resources from the 2010 Census here. You can go directly to the 2014 American Community Survey um, here, and you can go to the Population Estimates Program here. Uh, the advantage of this is that it's going to tell you uh, directly where you're getting your numbers from, which as librarians we all know we need to tell everyone what the citation is for our data. Um, the Census 2000, that's an added bonus that they're giving you some historical information. Um, I said there might be 1990 um, information on here. There's not for this, um, for this particular one. Uh, on here, you can switch the table, s switch this data point to the different sources that you've got. Now, the difference between these sources is that the 2010 census is an actual count of the people in a specific geography at a specific point. Um, the decennial census has happened every year since 1790, and it will continue to happen, sorry, every 10 years since 1790, and it will continue to happen every 10 years, and that is an actual count. When um, the Census Bureau discovered that people were needing data in between those censuses, they started to do a survey called the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey has been done since the late 1990s, and there's data available for it um, starting in 2000, 2001, um, and going forward. There are some American Community Survey data that are not available at certain geographic levels, simply because it is a, um, an estimate it's based on uh, a survey that's sent to just a portion of the American public. So it does limit some of the results that you can get. However, during the 2010 census, uh, the, the 2010 census only had 10 questions. And the reason for that is that the American Community Survey is now the place that the Census Bureau asks all of that other really rich data about the economy, about um, income and education level, and all of that really great uh, research data that you, can, you could previously find in the decennial census. So now it's being collected by the American Community Survey each and every year. So the ACS is actually a, a very good resource to go to. Um, it can be a bit tricky because they, they hold the survey <clears throat> um, every year. Uh, however, they produce 
the data in one year, three year, and five year estimates. Um, one of my other webinars that I do is on specifically American community survey data, um, how it's collected and interpreting it. And it's a kind of tricky thing sometimes to um, understand those multi-year estimates. Um, as general data users like us. So uh, if you need help with uh, that kind of multi-year estimate data, if you have any questions on that, just give us a call here at the Data Center. Um, you can also uh, uh, refer to a line of Census Bureau publications called the Compass Guides. These are very helpful when you're pulling things from American Fact Finder and you need more information about the data that you're looking at. So I'm going to go to a section of the website, Census Bureau's website called Guidance for Data Users. And they have a few different ACS related guides. So this is when to use one year, three year, or five year estimates. And they're basically gonna, gonna let you know um, at what level one year, three year, and five year estimates are taken. One year um, estimates in general are going to be um, more timely. So if you're looking at 2009, um, that one year estimate is what you're gonna wanna look for. Um, if you're looking for um, a smaller geographical area that's not covered by a one-year estimate, then sometime it, sometimes it's going to be available in a, in a three- or a five-year estimate. It is um, confusing, but they try to provide some, some explanation of how and when these are collected and what the advantage of using each are. So one year estimates are based on 12 months of collected data, three year estimates are based on 36 months of collected data, and five year estimates are based on 60 months of collected data. The population thresholds are 65,000 for one-year estimates, 20,000 for three-year estimates, and the five-year estimates provides data for all areas. So one-year estimates, the survey collects the smallest sample size. So it's going to be more timely, but perhaps less reliable. The five-year estimates collect data from the largest sample size. So the, these are going to be the most reliable resources. These are going to be the ones that you go to when you're analyzing a small geographic area. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll go back to the guidance for data users. Um, you'll see here also the comparing ACS data. Um, and you'll be able to see other training presentations which are directly for using ACS. So you can, you can browse through these, look at which data tool should I use. Um, the handbooks are really great. You can see um, different audiences that the ACS data is used for. Uh, if you have a patron that you're helping with data from the ACS, this what general data users need to know is very helpful. But <clears throat> there's also um, education related. Um, guidebooks, so what high school teachers need to know is very helpful. There's what researchers need to know, what state and local governments need to know. And then they have very specific data users, such as data for American Indians and Alaska Natives, um, data for rural areas, what the business community and what media needs to know. So these are, these are really wonderful resources, especially because the ACS is still um, somewhat uh, somewhat new and um, sometimes misunderstood by Census Bureau data users. So I'm going to go back to the American Fact Finder and back to the main um, portal. 
And I'm going to go into advanced search because this is the search that I usually use. <clears throat> we'll go to show me all. And I'm going to basically sh go through a, um, uh, the process of downloading a few tables uh, that perhaps somebody may be looking for if they're looking for um, a looking for data that they are using for applying for a grant. Um, say I was in Monticello and I needed to know basic population data, just the the most uh, basic number. I would go down to topics and go to people and go to basic count and estimate. And then from here go to population total. So as you'll see this whole process is kind of opening up a new window, selecting what you need and then the thing that you need gets put into this your selections box. So we're going to close that out. Now in my box I have population total and the place that I'm looking under and the results that we've got here are 128 tables. So we still want to narrow that down a little bit. You can look on the right hand side and you can see what data sets there are represented here in, these, in the search. So you've got your 2014 five year estimates which we talked about. The five-year estimates are going to be more reliable for a smaller geography, which Monticello is. So let's go to that and see what kind of data it gives us. So it looks like it's going to give us a whole host of different demographics. So we've got age by sex here at the top of the table. We've got population by race. We've got Hispanic or Latino, and we've got total housing units. So this is a table that many grant um, users and, uh, and applicants for grants may need in order to uh, apply for their grants. Often, if it is a federal grant, they're going to um, need the Census Bureau data uh, and the ACS data is acceptable in that case. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to take another drink of water. <clears throat> so say we wanted to deliver this data to um, the person that was applying for the grant. We can choose different ways to present the data. If we go to modify table, there are many different tools we can use to alter the appearance of this table. So we can collapse and expand the different categories, uh, rearrange our columns and rows, or we can actually sort within the table before we um, either download this in a, an Excel spreadsheet or download it as a PDF. So you can make the changes to the table without having it in an Excel spreadsheet, which is kind of nice. You can also go to different years right over here in this little handy um, box or legend. You can go to back to 2010 here. So say we want to go back to 2013. We, um, we have same, same table, different year. And let's go to modify table again and I think one of the nicest things about this application for me has been the transpose rows and columns. So it automatically transposes this for you. Whereas it's sometimes kind of hard to figure out how to do that in Excel. It's right there for you to do. So we're going to go to this view and I'm going to download this view so we go up to download and we can download this in a PDF or an Excel. I'm going to download it in Excel. This one was pretty fast. The, there are other uh, tables 
that you will access that are very large and will take a little bit of time. So it looks like my pop-up got blocked. Let's try that one more time. Download, Excel, OK. I'm going to try that one more time. It shouldn't really take that long for this. OK. So it downloaded my Excel table. I'm going to open it up. And um, always, always, the Census Bureau likes to include a lot of notes. So you're going to see the notes first, but scroll down a little bit, and you'll see the rest of the table. So it's giving us the entire table, race. Hispanic or Latino and say we want this in PDF. We'll download it. PDF. Okay. Download. Take a look at the PDF. So this is a static image of the entire table. Now, because we had it in that view that was more horizontal, it gave us 17 pages, which you probably won't want to do for your patron because it's kind of hard to read. Um, but this is, you know, this is how that one looks. So I'm going to go back, change the rows and columns, and download that again in PDF. And see how that one turned out. That one's a little easier to read. And it's only three pages. I say that's, a, that's an improvement. <laughs> OK. So we're going to go back to American Fact Finder. And I think we've done everything that we need to do with this table. So I'm going to go back to Advanced Search right here. And let's try maybe one more search in American Fact Finder. I want to go into the Geographies box, so I'm going to clear this entire um, search. So our Selections box is empty, and we're open um, and ready to do some more searching. I'm going to go to the Geographies box. Now from here, I'd like to get to the lowest geographical level that I can, which is normally a census block. To do this, I need to choose the radio button for all geographic types. So it says select a geographic type. I go to the menu, and I scroll down. And you'll find that there are many, many geographic types here. So you need to kind of pay attention to what these lower numbers are to see where you're going in the menu. So place, which is a city or town, is here. But what I want is a little smaller than that. It'll be a census tract or a census block. So I'm going to scroll even further down. Here's our state legislative district. That's available. School district. MSAs, and then you get into a little bit uh, more local terminology. There are New England city and town areas, urban areas, zip code areas. So I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll back up and see if I can get to let's see block or block group. Looks like that. That menu is so large that I'm going to go ahead and choose block. So 
So what you're looking here is the lowest number, and it looks like that is it, black, which is 100. And it lets you choose which, uh, which decennial census you'd like to look at. Let's look at the year 2000, and let's look at something in Indiana. Let's say Johnson County, which is where I just moved. Select a census tract. Um, this is the part of your search where you're probably um, you're probably going to want to use the Census Bureau's website to look up tract maps and block maps to actually see where these census tracts and blocks are. Um, and I can help you with any of that tract and block research. One of the things that we have here at the data center um, are census tract block um, and census tract and block maps and data going uh, back to before they used the, the terminology tract and block, before those geographies even um, existed, which was uh, pre-1940s. So if you need help locating these tract maps and block maps, contact the state data center. If you're using uh, tract and block research um, where you're looking into other states, say you're doing states that border Indiana, we've got some of those um, in our FDLP collection. We've also got, um, we, we can provide access to some of that online for the last couple of censuses, so 2010 or 2000. So um, if you're looking for tract and block maps, come and see us. We can also print uh, maps for you. We have a large format printer that we use for that, uh, and there are um, many different kinds of maps that we can print out for you. Uh, th those are special requests, and you just need to contact me uh, or contact someone at the State Library to do that. For now, for the sake of brevity, we'll just choose this first census tract, and then we're going to select block group one, which is all of these different blocks. So this is a huge group of blocks. I'm just going to choose these first two blocks and add to my selection. And while it's doing that, I'm going to go to the Census Bureau's glossary. They have a handy glossary. And we're going to look up the definitions for census tract and census block. First tract. It may be under census tract. <laughs> Let's see, tract. So this is what the Census Bureau has as their definition. As they say, the boundaries for a tract may follow legal geography boundaries and other non-visible features. Um, what it's saying there is that when you're looking at a tract map, some of the natural boundaries like water boundaries, that may be a tract boundary, um, and sometimes it's just a street. Census tracts ideally contain about 4,000 people and 1,600 housing units. So that's, yeah, that's your basic um, idea of what a census tract is. It's a census-created geography, and it contains approximately 4,000 people. The block is just a smaller version of the tract. We have all kinds of different things in this. OK. After, OK, so for the block definition, it's not necessarily giving us a population threshold, 
but it's basically what makes up the tract. So every tract, which contains about 4,000 people, is broken up into multiple blocks. Census Bureau established blocks covering the entire nation for the first time in 1990. So that means that they covered the entire nation in 1990, but the block geography actually existed back to 1940. And that's one of the things that the Census Bureau has used since 1940 to uh, categorize different parts of the population by geography. So over 8 million blocks in the U.S. were identified in 2000 and over 11 million for the 2010 census. And for each of those blocks, you can get um, demographic data. So that's a pretty powerful way to do research, uh, uh, is to get down to that neighborhood level data. And um, like I was saying, Savvy.org is the organization that's able to pull all of that block data together and give you information for those neighborhoods. So it's a very handy um, resource. If I had time, I would take you to Savvy. I think we're probably going to wrap it up. And if anybody has any questions while we're still on, um, does anybody um, want to ask, ask any questions? Feel free to type in the chat box. And if nobody is uh, wanting to ask any questions right now, please feel free to call or email the State Data Center or the State Library directly. Um, we love hearing from you. One of the things that I like to do is do these trainings um, via webinars, and I also go out to libraries and organizations and uh, talk about the same thing that I've talked about um, today with them. We, we do a lot of step-by-step -step training as well, just through um, uh, interfaces like American Fact Finder or Stats Indiana or Savvy.org. Uh, I will come to you or your organization uh, and give you a customized training session on how to use these different tools. Uh, if anybody needs that, please don't hesitate to contact me. I can even do one-on-one -on -one sessions. We're happy to do that as well. So since there are no more questions, I guess we'll end the webinar. Thank you so much for attending. And um, I think, as Paula said, she'll be uh, posting this and send, we'll also be able to send out some of the um, slides or uh, the whole collection of slides if you'd like that. So thank you very much.